We are talking heads. Talking heads. Levels exceed the red. Metal heads. We're talking heads. Levels exceed the red. Pushing the mud to the edge. Heavyweight pressure coming down for the metal heads. Are you ready for this? Talking heads. Talking heads. It's just my label, you know, Metal is my label and I've been running it. I started with Doc Scott many years ago, 001. And it was just a prototype label, which I guess it still is in that sense. I mean, he is a figurehead, you know. We have a few in the scene that are like really important key figures and, and you know, there's Goldie and there's Blue Rider and Frosty, all these people that really hold up the whole thing and make it solid. No, there's been there uh, since like the big, the, the big explosion, you know what I mean? It was, uh, all the elements in metal, as all the artists have been there since like day dot. Goldie, with what he did with Manners, really did take the scene and the whole drum and bass thing uh, to another level. For me, Metalhead sort of, it, it brought a lot of people together and within those sort of ranks everyone sort of set the basic standards of how the music is today. Concepts ahead, everyone's in their head. It's just saying their heads must keep their heads and just go forward. It's not saying that Metalhead is a label, it's the most prestigious whatever. We don't blow any horns, man. It's about a lot of people that have been creative, that have been together and making it work. They've, they've done a wicked, wicked job. If you look at the back catalogue, I mean, there's very few labels that have got a back catalogue as rich as the Metalhead's back catalogue, you know. really weird that it's the kind of symbol. I mean, this guy Darren did it, and it was really weird because it always reminded me of a very strong icon because it was it was it was literally meaning that long after I'm dead and everybody else is dead, the music will still be here, which is why it's a skull with a pair of headphones on. I don't reckon there's many other labels, you know, around that you know you can have that kind of artistic freedom to do what you want. And there's no real bar barriers, you know, holding you back from, you know, taking it a step further. That's what Metalheads is about. There's so many different people involved within it, like, from so many different backgrounds. We're not all coming from a, a jazz background, we're not all coming from a rock background, you know, it's all different. The thing about Metalheads, when that came along, it came at a time when there was beginning to be a little bit more of a segregation in British clubland. Somehow, I don't know what happened, but you know, rave came along and it kind of made things either sort of white or black somehow. You know what I mean? And so when I went to Speed and certain breakbeat clubs in the early days, it was the first time for some time that I was going to clubs where I was getting this mixture again, and that really meant a lot to me. Well, the Blue Note, of course, used to be um, used to be the bass clef. People were getting sick of the West End policies and all that business, and the fact that you couldn't really find a good small club in London to play intense music. So, in a way, the timing was brilliant, and and you know they set the place up, and it was a huge success. Obviously, it was there that Metalheads really kind of kicked off. Blue Knot has just finished us for three years and it's just restarted the complex. I mean, the complex was an old haunt of ours. But it's just weird. I mean, I, I've had so much fun that it's just gone like that. And three years have just been just gone. It's the way they went, they just went. It's a place that people go to listen to new tunes. It's the only regular, well, three years. And whoever's going to come, you missed it. Blue Note, school, school for drum and bass, man. It's like going to school. Yeah. You do your weekly class. You know, you go to Blue Note, you hear what the new shit is. Yeah. Who's doing what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who's playing what, who's mixing up, whatever. It's, it's school, man, do you know what I mean? It's, it's not like going to a club, it's school and everybody knows that. I think that's the sort of original place where you can sort of play where you want, you know, play what you want, you know? Like DJs in there really go for it proper, you know? I mean, you, you get a, a total cross-section of people. I mean, from, from I've had people turn up and say they, they're in the country for three days, they've just come from Denmark, or, you know, hi, I'm from Copenhagen, or I'm from Iceland, or... But then you get people who are from North London, South London, West London. You also get people driven down from Watford, Manchester. So they come from everywhere. I mean, even you get people from the States. 
people who might be in town for a week and they still make it down. Yeah, so so you know it's kind of like a global little global family there. At clubs, hard tunes go down well and like hard beats and hard bass lines. That's what that's what people want. That's what they want to hear at a club. People want, I mean, yeah, people want music. It's gonna make them dance. It's gonna make them move. It's about. As I said, creating an atmosphere. Yeah. Although some DJs, I've heard Scott come on, Doc Scott come on, and bring it right down before he drops something that's lethal, lethal. <laughs> I'll never forget that when Groove Rider plays and he tears down, like, down the whole place all the time every time he plays. I'll never forget those moments there. Couldn't they ain't stupid, they know music. Yeah, they, know their, they know their beats. Uh -huh. As a DJ, you'll have certain certain things, and you you might be you'll be playing certain tunes, and you'll think in different places. You're thinking right that these guys aren't ready for this one yet, but in Blue Note they're always ready. They're always ready, and you're just dropping the new shit there, definitely. When you're in the club, you know you're all in there. You know, I mean, everyone can hear what tunes are being dropped, and like you know, if anyone's coming with any new styles, you know, everyone's going to hear it. You know, so it's like the place to be, really. If you're going to hear a new style of beat, you're going to hear it there first, I reckon, more than anywhere else, because people are more inclined to uh, experiment with their music down there rather than. A lot of people have been to Blue Note or whatever and they've heard about Metalheads and when it comes to their town, when they do a tour or stuff like that, everybody's there because they want to get on the, they want a piece of the action, they want it, you know, they, they want a piece of the vibe. And they know that it's going to be of a certain standard, you know, and of a certain quality. It's all about my head, you understand? My head is bad, you understand? It's the biggest and best thing going I think people just didn't have the confidence that, that that these small scenes could ram out big places, you know. And of course they can, you know. We used to do it at the fridge, and and you know, you could, there's nothing better than sort of playing underground music to two, three thousand people. Do you know what I mean? And I think that now that the complex has come along, and you've got all those different options and all those better sound systems, you can really, you know, basically pump up hardcore music. Yeah, there's a there's a vibe at, at the clubs, obviously, because that's where everyone meets up. You know, that's where everyone would always be together. At a club, unless you do some kind of type of meeting or you know, someone said we go we go go kart racing. It's gonna be cheers and beers and a few dog steers. Now, it's about the speed right, right. now. Jay Magic out happens to be right. the Don driver as far as their heads are concerned. So, I'm just gonna follow his black line on the track. I, I was very worried about this race before. <laughs> I've got no gold if you know, it's took away my weight. I lost about a pound in weight now, so that should make my advantage a little bit better. <laughs> no, that's five. Next step in the uh, Next step in the motion, I get a metal that's five. Well, you have some. If you're in any doubt as to the amount of space available to drive through, don't do it. There's plenty of time out there. Take them somewhere else. Teams, do you want to do that in here before we go next door? Who thinks they can drive? Who thinks they can drive? I'm over here. I'm over here, man. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. He's my team, man. Okay. Who's got a team? Who else has got a team? Bring that in Hey! Ah! Hey! 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 Listen to the drum and the bass, take you higher Cause we come to inject it, we come to play it We come to rock it, so we come to smash it Headstrong Ten years ago I was at work like everybody else I suppose and one day came Acid House. <laughs> That's when my life changed. It wasn't until 93, 94 when I started to hear what was then called Hardcore Stroke Jungle and was changing into drum and bass and I heard a couple of tracks, one by Bookham in particular, a track called Music and what I liked about it, it was just uh, 
and Apollo as well. Just they were just simple and clean tracks that just had funk in in a new way I hadn't heard before. '88, I was I was probably just about discovering the hardcore scene then. I mean, there was a there was a group over here called Spiral Tribe Travelers who used to you know raid people's fields and set up tents and sound systems, and that was the first. You know, my introduction to hardcore was Spiral Tribe, basically, in a field with loads of people off their heads on the E, and, you know. <laughs> Before that, I was a hip-hop boy. That's all that, that powered me was hip-hop. For me, the big thing about drum and bass is the fact that it is, to me, a parallel to hip-hop. The fact that when hip-hop started, it was two turntables and a, and a mic, and it was the fact that it was something brand new, and there was an ocean of potential, because rock and roll is tired, you know, they keep regurgitating the old things, and you just need every now and again just to close the door and to look into a wide space and go, oh, wow, this is the potential, so you start off with a planet rock, and then you get a, you know, then you get, I don't know, you get a tribe called Quest, and then you can get a Wu-Tang Clan, you know, things develop, you know, and with hip with drum and bass, to me it's the same thing. It's early days really, we're just five or six years into it. First originally they used to call it like bonehead music. When I used to work at City Sounds, they used to call me Ray Bonehead because it was so intense. And then it came up with like great hardcore. No, it's, it started off as hardcore and then after hardcore, um, oh, we started calling it jungle. And jungle stayed with the scene for a long time. And then it went into like, you know, uh, uh, dark, do you know what I mean? And then it kind of went into jump up and drum and bass and now the new term for it is jungle stroke drum and bass. I would say it's, it's a music to express the times we're living in right now. I think it's just music of today, but it can be listened, you know, at any time. It's like, like when Goldie called his album Timeless. It's kind of summed it up really, hasn't it, in one, in one word. Anytime, doesn't matter. I mean, we still listen to 70s music now. I mean, I see dance music, the whole scene, uh, a tra as a train journey back from the 70s and 80s. There's this, there's this one journey, and there's trains going down these tracks, and every couple of years it stops. And, and it's all one music. It's all back from funk, from, from jazz, going to electro, going to hip hop, going to disco music, going to house music, going to rave music, and every now and again, one of these music springs off and creates a little scene. And some of them grow massive, and others stay small and have their small followers. So of course, drum and bass is at the front of that train at the moment. Influences really start from people like Marvin Gaye, Herbie Hancock, Yellow Jackets, Bob James, more of a sort of jazz, funk, fusion and, and soul based background. The inspiration for me was just, just really to, I heard some things that were so different from what I'd heard before and I, that's what inspired me, do you know what I mean, rather than one person. And my dad used to listen to a studio on reggae, his sister was grab listening to soul, a lot of rare groove. It was for me when I was at school and I was just listening to, I was in the whole rave scene and the hip hop early scene and it was, I mean, it was difficult really because I was like 14, 15 and I couldn't get into pubs because I was too small. In terms of really getting into the music, it was the whole sort of breakdance era that really kind of intensified the whole feeling. I don't know, it was just like reggae artists I was into, like Dennis Brown, Frankie Paul, like you, there's just loads of them, you know. Um, and then like uh, hip hop was Mantronics, a lot of the, like Big Daddy Kane and stuff like that, you know, I was, I was into that sort of stuff. Yeah, Ultra Magnetic MC is like one of my all time favorites. I mean, from way back in the day. See, for me, my influences are from like people like The Clash and James Brown, and it's all, it's all fucked up, it's all mixed up, you know what I mean? But these are people that I've grown with. I like a lot of the 70s uh, jazz, psychedelic jazz, and funk, like Funkadelic. Yeah, and Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock, all those kind of people. I wasn't really even listening to the vocals or anything like that, it was just the beats I was into. 
they like all kinds of music for all kinds of reasons. They listen to sounds, you know, they're not biased towards something. If they hear an old Annie Lennox track and there's a good vocal part, they'll use it. If they hear a bit of Sun Ra and they like that kind of weird electronic keyboard he used in 1968, they'll use it. You know, they're not kind of, oh, that's jazz, we're not going to use that. They're very open-minded musically and I think that's very important. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, as I say, that train, we've got the whole, all those carriages behind us to go through and look at and just pull out what we want. The whole, the whole music moves, it moves at such a, such a fast pace, you know, it really does because um, evolution is such a, is a, is such a, a main ingredient of drum and bass, which is what keeps it fresh, which is what keeps it interesting. People that are into our music and, you know, buy our music, you know, whatever, they, whatever they're doing around our music, they kind of feel the, the vibe of us as people because when we're making the music, that's our soul coming out of us, you know, and it's, it's kind of jumping out onto vinyl, so you can listen to what's inside of R2 hits. It's the first British music since punk, which is, has got an identity, really. I mean, if you ask anyone about drum and bass, they immediately say England or London or Bristol or wherever. So it's, it's the first music since punk to have a real to have his home in the UK, which is something that we're proud to be involved in, really. So it's good as a movement that we can all look back in 30 years, whatever, and say we started something. In one hand, it's brilliant because you can go and do it in your bedroom, and you know the real dons will come through with their own sounds, and therefore they will be at the forefront of it. But the scene does need the four heroes to come along and to take the level to that higher point. And it's the same with Groove Rider, and with Goldie, and with Ronnie Size, and with DJ Crust, and Dylan J. Vaughan. So they're we're waiting for the next man to kind of go one step further and that's the great thing about that scene. You've got people like, uh, as you said, you've got called Digital Ed Rush and all those people that are, uh, and, and Dillinger, that are real uh, base uh, scientists, you could call them, that are pushing the boundary forwards when it comes to mutating base sounds. This is the finish, one of the finished breaks that I've, I've been working on. He's out there on his own, man. He's got his own sounds, constant inspiration. And the thing, he never likes any of his tunes. You ask anybody and they're like, I can't understand it because he never likes any of his records. I find when I do a track, maybe I, I, I don't put all, I don't, I don't never put all my all into a track. I've, I've never, I, think, I don't think I've ever done that yet. I, what I do with a track, I might get like the breaks done and certain parts of the track that I really like done. And then, I just fill up the rest of the track with sounds that are similar to what I want. You can hear a Dillinger tune within the first four bars, you're like, that's Carl. You just know. Is it the bass? I mean, it's his beats. It, it, before his bass even drops, you, you, you know it's Carl. <laughs> in there right now is just a just a kick just a it's all in there right. it's in there right now you've got Carl you know what I mean he's, he's, he's knocking out some really fat tunes the things that he's doing with bass lines you understand you know he's coming with just like totally unique styles and you know he's trying you know I can't hear him you know, I mean copying anyone at all you know there's no there's no it's like he's on his own he's doing his own thing you know and it's like he's creating his own sound and he's going his own direction there's different techniques of distorting your bass you can do it live you can That's just the that's just the basic flat kick, and then like you can. There's loads of ways to do it. You can just put another, you can double it up and sort another extra bass line track on it. You get a lot of hiss, and then hiss, but yeah. it keeps it, it keeps it raw. Totally. When it comes in, it's like a, an atmosphere to it. And you can. There's just different ways you can do it. But that's how, that's the way I'm doing it today. Wow. There's loads of ways you can you can get that distorted sort of feel. The first time I met Delinja, he started talking to me about um, hertz and frequencies, and I was like, oh, man, this guy, this guy knows his bass. You know, he, he's into it for like serious, you know. Carl, Carl's the worst one. He's, he's got tannoys, but his tannoys go lower than my ones. And, uh, 
several <laughs> several councillors. My biggest influence is Dillinger, really. Dillinger's, Dillinger's a very powerful artist, very quiet, but very powerful artist. I mean, he's, he's whole. He's a bit of a demon, man. I mean, he's, Carl really could take any, any dance floor apart and, and has done for many, many years because Carl's that kind of guy. And the breaks are all together at the moment. But... frequencies that he gets, the, the way his tunes sound totally apart from everybody else's because of the, the way he sets up the bass frequencies, he's got a total understanding of what he wants to hear, you know. Uh, that's just me barking. <laughs> Human bark. Sometimes I get sample CDs, now and then, now and then, but if I can do it myself, I'll just get the mic out. I just make a noise with my mouth, I twist it up in the sample or whatever, and it just sounds like an effect. I need to get sessioners in to play what I want them to play. Because sometimes you, you can't always find a sample in a certain key. I mean, you can stretch and at the end of the day, you're losing quality. You can never find exactly yeah. what you want. Whereas now I'm working on my album, I'm actually getting people in and telling them what I want to play, and just locking it all in tight. Just resampling it. Different, different drops. Different percussion sounds. Sort of. A little funk thing. Yeah. I want everybody to make rec good records so I can have more records to play. Blasphemy is going on! Blasphemy! There's some wickedness going on out there. I don't like it, you know. I'm gonna go and look for my mate. Where are those advocates? Where are us? For you heads, we're abstracting it. Abstract it from the metal, hardcore design. Roving in the we abstract it from the metal. It's literally like like surfing, like hopping on a wave, it just takes you away and you, you, it's almost like you get into a state where you can't do any wrong. Whether you feel happy, sad, or you feel aggressive, or you feel whatever, it's the, the communication of feeling in music. So therefore, we don't have to necessarily lay down, you know, verses and choruses of repeatedly saying the same thing. We can sort of make the listener use their imagination more. The irrelevant of what, what bracket you may put it in, if it's good, it will affect people in one way or another. It will touch them. Before, how it used to happen was, uh, used to have the top guys, as I said, like, uh, yeah, like uh, Goldie and uh, uh, Four Hero and Fotech and all those kind of people. They was putting out tunes that would make a lot of people in the, in the scene think, how do they do that? And then and they'd go in their, they'd go in their bedroom at, or in their studio and try the most techniques and new things will be discovered. You create so much different sounds, so much different bass lines, you do things with breaks, you know, you, and when you put them together, you, create, you do create a, a total new sound. It's all about vibes, really. So I work a lot with Ed Rush and Fierce, and we have a little kind of group of people we work with. You know, and I think for us it's just about the vibes and the tunes always, man. This is where we do virus. This All the virus stuff gets done here. And is this where you've been doing the album with Rush? 
Yeah, yeah. We've been kind of doing it. We haven't been telling anyone we're doing it. We've just been doing it the last six months as we go along. Today's the last sort of day we have to get a track sort of. Or maybe two tracks. No, we've got, we've got to beat <laughs> So yeah, today's the final day we have to get any sort of any new material done for the album. It's been like six months in the making, huh? Uh, Ish. About that. Maybe even a little bit more. But we sort of made it without even realising, you know, we just, just came in this room once a week and, and sort of made a track a week and now we've got a, a build up of material so <clears throat> it makes sense really to put it all out at once. This is what I call the heart of the studio, the uh, sampler, the e sampler. <laughs> everything that's that's the texture man he knows you know he knows about layering the tunes and getting maybe deep more of a deep texture out of it more of a, a, a wider soundscape if you like um matt also knows about all the techniques and if i say you know that sound say sound a for example mm. i feel it should be a bit more whatever if i use a word to describe it matt knows what i'm talking about and within two presses of a button and a little processing it's there this is so nice very often a tune might be in a certain way up until the last hour yeah, and, just all and in the last hour it's like wait a minute that b line's all right but to be honest with you i know between us we can do something a lot better than that and and the other one's like yeah i know i've been feeling the same thing as well so very often it's even you know in even in the last half an hour of making the tune that can shape the whole thing you know obstacle i was into the way these ones experiment because he always be i mean obstacle is one of the i mean true engineers of music generally general music has been involved in a lot of different things he's got that he focused on drawing bass as his forte <laughs> that Matt Optical is like pretty much inundated with remixes and he's got his own album projects, him and Everest have got a virus project coming out and all the twelves he does, I mean that guy is 24-7 in the studio. <laughs> looking to just push it forward and just move it into the next dimension put it for another little effects unit and put it back into the sampler and twist it up again they call our scary strings on this thing really but they like to sample other people so this is a whole album here <laughs> uh, we coming back in a minute there you go as, as time goes on and we're making the track, it kind of shapes then. It's a sort of uh, a, a sort of piece it together as we go along job, really. So this should be the track, hopefully. It's all about a let off, you know. I mean, people, I think people's true character comes out in the music when you hear something like somebody could be quiet, but like not outgoing and loud spoken and that, but in their music they express themselves properly. artist to be able to make a record tomorrow or tonight, play it out on Slate tomorrow and have it on the streets a week later, that's really important. Do it on a Friday, play it on a Saturday and you, you know, you, you see if you can gauge the reaction. That's, yeah. that's what um, Shadowboxing was. Shadowboxing was, was, was a, a night in the studio, a rough mixed down track and it, and it um, came together. You make the tune and you cut it on dub and you go out that weekend and you just get instant response. The Metalheads is the most respected uh, drum and bass uh, label by far. I think it's definitely the one that pushes back, you know, the premises and breaks new ground all the time. Distortion doesn't really matter with drum and bass, so it's always just got to be loud. It's like if it distorts a bit and that doesn't matter too much as long as it cuts through and makes people's ears bleed. <laughs> 
case of listening to the track, making it sound, you know, sorting out what, what EQ you need, i.e. Uh, does it need more bass, more top, do you need to bring the snare out, do you need to make it sound grungy or whatever. Um, get all your levels set, you know, just you're happy with it. Then once you've got all that together, you're going to cut it in there. Um, and that's just how to drum and bass is cut one track at a time straight onto, straight onto the line. You know, they'll push all the machinery to, to make it distort and to make it sound this grungy sound. And um, So I suppose that is using it in the wrong way because it's like digital and it's supposed to be um, exact and pure and this, that and the other. And that's why digits were invented, I suppose, to make it more exact. And they're sort of misusing it, I guess, to make this effect. Dylan <laughs> probably my toughest client because when he comes in it's like literally I have to cut something three times because you, you, you're pushing the lathe so much something always goes wrong over and it's literally like I'm sitting there thinking uh, um, the, the lathe's going to blow up and then you're talking like between around £10,000 to get it fixed I mean that the, the head blows and Dillinger just pushes and pushes and pushes he's like one of the most um, level conscious uh, drum and bass artists and it's all very distorted and in your face and it's tough to cut but it's worth it you know everyone comes in and says to me you know when the Dillinger track comes out you really know about it so it slaps you in the face end of the day you've got to make the music that the DJ wants to play so I think that is the most important thing that you've got tunes that are accessible to a dance floor and that have got life and have got an atmosphere and that are tunes that people want to hear really. Lemon D and Dillinger you know what I mean they're wicked producers now as they've got a bit older now they're going to start to DJ you'll see a different type of vibes. Over the last say, three or four years I haven't seen any DJ um, come into a, a, a division, I call it the Premier League, right? In the Premier League, you're through by the Fabio, Doc Scott, Randall, Andy C, DJ Hype, and all those, all the well-known names, yeah. The last four years, I haven't seen nobody break into that. It's like, it's like, it's closed off kind of thing. The last guy that did get into there was Andy C, Andy C, yeah. And he got in there via his tune, Long Dark Tunnel, Flew Up, Massa. A long time ago, they termed uh, everyone wants to be a DJ, everyone wants to be an MC. There, there was even, you know, tracks coming out with those lyrics in them. Um, and that is the case today, you know. A lot of people, they've got an interest in it and, they, you know, they, they, they feel that they want to express that through either MC or DJ. Just listen, being versatile is my aim or my mission. In the drum and bass scene, you've got to be original. I'm watching my sounds of playing with different methods. You better run for cover when I'm blasting through the speakers. The thing with DJing is just knowing knowing the crowd. I mean, it might take you 20 minutes to get your feet with the crowd. You drop a few different styles, see what, see what they're bouncing off more, and then you can head more in that direction. It's got to be a must. Rough and rugged, no confusion. It's got to be a must. Rough and rugged. You got your records, you hunt for your tunes, you know, and then you put them together. You go out and you play it, you put the tunes together, and if that's the sound you like, that's what you will play. And if the crowd happens to like that, and you know, then they're still good for them at the end of the day. But the way I look at it, it's nice to put two fat tunes together. You know, if you can put two fat tunes together and create a really fat mix, you know, you really you make, a, make a big impression on the crowd. You definitely will. It's about playing music to me. I don't care who's in the audience. To get what I'm saying, it's just the fact that there's an audience is enough for me. It doesn't matter who it is. To get what I'm saying. So from there, I try to do the best that I can to make them kind of move. You know, and it's... It's a buzz for me to do that, so I'm not looking at the faces, I'm looking at the feet. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those situations, so that's how it works. It's like football, it's like tennis. Some days you have a good day and some days you have a bad day, but I think a good DJ is someone who can be consistent and no matter what they're going through or what's, you know, what turmoil is in their head at that time, they can switch off and just concentrate on the crowd and, and entertain them. When you go in the rave and you see how it is, you just feel from there really, rather than say, I'm going to play that, I'm going to play that. When I was younger and DJing in my bedroom, I always imagined being in like the scenario of a club atmosphere where you've got the crowd out there and whatever you play, you can take them on whatever like journey they need to go on. And it's just it's an unbelievable feeling when you catch the right vibe and everything's clicking and you just it's almost it's, it's like autopilot, you don't need to think about it, you look in your box and it's like that record, that record, this mix that you know, it's just it all clicks together. What is it all about? It's all about the drums and the bass. It's all about the platinum brakes. Listen to the drum and bass sound we demonstrate. It's kind of a subconscious thing, you don't consciously know 
what you're going to play or where you're going to play it, but you just feel the vibe and you try not to make like really conscious changes, you know what I mean? Try and keep it flowing on the same vibe. Some things are planned, but you know, 50-50, uh, man. Sometimes you just, something comes into your head and you just, yeah, say on the mic. It's from the crowd and from the DJ spinning and you know I mean, you just, you pick up some certain things and you just, yeah. It all, it all just depends like the mood you're in and what's going on and it depends it's a lot of feeling. That's what it's all about, just the feeling. That's what the DJ's all you know about. I mean? It's about working with the crowd. You feel what they want and you go with them. I mean, at the end of the day, I think in, in any in any like style of music, if you get a set of DJs, they're gonna they're gonna have friendly competition. If they don't, the music's gonna die. There has to be friendly competition to take the to take the public every week to that cutting edge. You know? Because they have to be at that cutting edge within themselves. You know what I mean? Because if, if, if Groove slips for a week, someone's going to cut it. You know what I mean? If, if Scotty slips for a week, someone's going to cut it. So, so, so they all got to be on point. It's the bumping sound of course the break that body down. Murder heads massive, are you ready for this? Head simply, break big specialist. So send this stop taking over, so check it. Check it, check it, check it, check it, check it. As soon as you drop a tune in and if the crowd starts going mad, then you know that, you know what I mean, that's a good tune. And then if you bring in another good tune, you're mixing the two together and then the whole crowd's going to be, you know what I mean, going berserk. Then, well, it's just, you know, that's an experience on its own, really, I suppose. Finally, Mo. Look at Mo, man. Mo's cool. Mo's DJ in the head, you know what I mean? He'll DJ that, is not he? And you listen to Marley and you can hear Randall as well, because Randall scored him out. Which is no different than Source Direct. Project, do you know what I mean? Miles very much like that, because he gives me, he gives me two jokes, I have a laugh. Miles very much like that. And Bailey, man, Bailey's like the heavyweight boots. He's coming with the heavyweight boots, man. I just, I just like to mix. I don't necessarily, every now and then, it depends what mood I'm in. Sometimes I might chop, um, I might chop a tune in and out here and there, but um, it's never going to sound out of place. I try not to make it sound that way anyway. To be a DJ, really, you have to have a, a, a love of music, so the two things go hand in hand. Uh, for me personally, anyway. But um, you know, I, I would never, I would never uh, stop DJing. You know. What I like to see DJing now, I like to see a whole spectrum of the music being played, especially like on a night. You know, you have your different styles of DJs on the, on the same lineup in the same room. I'm not a strictly breakbeat or strictly, you know, one type of music. I try and join different musical fields into one, you know, interesting, enjoyable, dynamic selection and I try and basically do this sort of thing so that it isn't a, an eclectic mess because I really don't like that word and I don't really like sort of the idea of going to a club and hearing some guy playing all kinds of weird shit from different areas. I like to hear someone who can really create a story. The main objective of any DJ is to make someone dance. We're coming down to bring the bass beat range and treble We're coming down to keep it hard like metal Smash the speakers, the rock, your heads Got to keep it rocking to the sound, metal heads Bad boys win Keep eating big breakfast and get ready for it Cause when I'm pulled, when I fucking pulled when we hit the corner, you know? Very, very hot, very hot, very bumpy. Not too good for the big guys, but we're managing. We're in third place. You've already, you've already done some tactics, which he doesn't know about. Sorry, sorry, yeah? Look at yeah. the scoreboard right about there, yeah? Right. Slug. Get your own team talk, Slug. mate. Own team talk. Slug. Get your own yeah. team oh, talk. Fucking cunt. Whenever I'm ready. Metalhead's number one. Good fuck top, yeah, good fuck top, nicely. Where is it? Go on, Jamie! Come on, Jamie! Go on, Jamie!
taking it. Much damage, yes, they're taking it. Metalheads, who's number one? Seconds. And in just a few moments, we're bringing the winning sequence cars out for a lap of honor. Oh, oh well. Lemon D's will always be like the son of Carl, he's the son of Dillinger. Because he, he, he's more of like a funky Dillinger in a sense, because he has a lighter side to it. But he's very Carl orientated in terms of the way he programs. Two years ago, it's sort of this sort of dark thing was coming because a lot of people were like, oh yeah, let's get nasty, which is cool. And uh, a lot of people sort of started to define, yeah, well, I can get nastier than you. And, do you know what I mean? It, which was good, but I think it, it, it's sort of it's got a bit sort of stale at the moment for me personally. Where it's like, okay, well, show what the music's about because it's not to stick to one sort of sound. When I bring it back, it's like. Personally, I like it slower because you can get a lot more in. Whereas now it's more faster, but it's more minimalistic because you can't fit music within that boundary. It's got they've taken it to the limit where you can put, you know, sounds at 175, but you can't put music to 175. So that's where it's stuck at this sort of thing now. And I think they're going to find well if we go back a few BPMs or we just stick to what we're doing and another sort of set of producers break away and do stuff a little bit slower. <laughs> I think that personally, it's like, you know, if, as long as uh, people start realising that you can't go too fast with the music and take it back down a bit and put music within the uh, boundaries, then uh, it might start changing. But um, at the moment, it's got to that point where they've realised we're getting faster. It's all good because, like, you know, it's keeping the crowd up, but the music does become a bit too minimalistic. I remember a track um, quite a few years ago, and it, it was made at what the guy who made it obviously thought is ridiculously fast and it's called something like this track's too fast and um, do you know what I mean it's obviously done as a bit of a joke like no one's ever going to make a record this fast and, and like like now obviously it's exactly what people do all the time if you can go back to the first tune and like you know in drum and bass like four or five years ago it's the drum and bass guys that were producing like filtering and stuff like that and now you can hear it in all the tunes now you can hear it in different music house and whatever and I think if they, as long as the equipment keeps progressing, I think the drum and bass thing will progress. But there's like, but you, I mean, I've got like about 30 different versions, so I'll keep tr drawing them in. So it all sounds organic instead of like a loop, do you know what I mean? Totally. I just use it as a template for now. Yeah. Once I get them all in, and I just change them around with different modes. Nowadays, it's progressed so much where you do need like the equipment and the technology. But back then, you just needed a simple setup, like for a grand or something. It's, it's simple, it's just basically a sampler, yeah? You go to, I'll show you my sampler. Basically, it's like you go, it's the same process, it's just you've got this hands on. So yeah. it's like sitting there and um, sitting there and doing it there. It's like, you just fucking, you just tweak it there. The technology involved in music making now gives you so much freedom, it gives you too much freedom actually. It's easy once you know how, you know, if someone you've had to use the equipment and everything, then you can find it, do you understand? Uh, if you're someone that just you wants to get that sound straight away, you don't know what to do, you know, you're going to go and buy the equipment, you're lost. I'm able to record my horns just into the hard disk and then they come up on the screen, I can move them around, I can take bits out, I can, you can never do that on a, like on a 24 track. So it's just like a tone, so I could go to a tone, yeah? But... 
these are all the same tones, really. It's just that someone's pre-programmed them and made shit out of it, you know? Change the waveform. Sometimes it can eat you. It can eat you up if you haven't got a social life. You've got to break away from it and you've got to do other things apart from uh, being in the studio because it can, like, crack you up. We've made friends with our machines. That's kind of what we've had to do, do you know what I mean? Because we haven't seen anybody. It's like, yeah, you know, the machines are your friends. Anyone can go into a studio and start, you know, twiddling a load of knobs, but if it doesn't sound right on the mix down, it'll sound sort of shit out on the club, you know what I mean? It's, it's a hard job. It can actually crack you up. Who are we picking our own team? You four be the rest of us. You four be the rest of us. But West Wall lets us first. Go on, I'll be on now. Let's this fella here. Junkie, but nettles, isn't it? Goldie's fucking rubbish at football. Any third cricket? I like netball myself. Awesome, blue spine. Great goal. Great goal. Trenton Shilton. Where is Trenton Peter Shilton right now? Trenton, you probably had a video, mate. Oh, yeah, we've been playing the basketball with low neck in. What? We've been playing like Bill, haven't we? Yeah. Had one up. I'll tell you, right? since I was 17 and I used to work in an art price and basically around that time that was when techno and that was just starting to sort of come through so I was like literally picking it up straight off the shelf. We started to uh, promote uh, sort of small series of underground illegal raves in our area where we come from. Uh, we'd have like 300 people come down and it would just be a hardcore kind of drug induced warehouse vibe of party. Yeah. The buzz of like of, a, of an illegal party yeah, and then the, the police coming and stopping it and a yeah. load of kids getting together and putting it on. Yeah, and that was, I think that was like the early buzz from the scene. It's the same with us, you know, don't get too complicated. It's all about like party thing and do a lot of tunes to play on systems, you know. DJ'd on a few pirate radio stations, Defection FM, Underground FM, Subtransmission FM. Um, from the radio stations build up a reputation or a relationship I should say with uh, Chemistry and Storm who basically introduced me to the whole Metalheads fraternity. I just always knew I was going to be a musician. My father told me to do something else but it didn't really work. I mean there's not many labels that can't put anything out for four months and five months and still be fucking out there because it's, that's just what we do. What do you do? Just be like every week Keep going until it's saturated, until it's fucked. You can't do that, man. And if it's not happening on the label, it's happening in the club. It's happening in the club, it's happening on the label. You know, you can you can go through and never realise that there's a whole different world beneath the surface, man, like the underground thing. A mate of mine played me a few records and I was like, what the fuck's this, man? I haven't fucking heard this on the radio, you know what I mean? It has gone mainstream, but it seems like... And when I say mainstream, I mean, like, a lot of adverts, um... Yeah, just a lot of television adverts, a lot of just background music behind presenters on TV shows. It's got all drum and bass rhythms, but for some reason or not, they don't seem to be produced by the, the, the real people in drum and bass. They're just the same old TV producers that get sample CDs and just emulating what the drum and bass people do. You can switch on your TV and listen to some advert and it's bare break beats on it. Do you know what I mean? So that just shows you how much we've had an effect on, on the whole scene and society. Because ten years ago, they would have thought, they would have said, what are you talking about, speeded brakes? You know what I mean? They didn't want to know. Even semi-consciously, 
you're listening to the music semi-consciously even so like like you say in an advert uh, a, a break thing sky sports or whatever you know you are hearing the music and people aren't even realizing that well it's it's difficult to say what mainstream really is it, look, if we look at the hip-hop scene you know we got we got the hardest tunes selling the most and you know but what is you know what is mainstream and what isn't it's who, whoever wants to listen to it and whoever wants to buy it. We've had a lot of artists and producers that have actually signed to majors and have actually released singles with the intention of going towards the charts or being commercially orientated in that way. I'm going to a major label of uh, guys sitting there chatting a load of crap and I'm not interested. You know, if he's got something to say, he's genuine and he's understanding where we're coming from, then we're interested. I don't think it is mainstream. I mean, um, fundamentally, it's just good. If we got drum and bass tracks on top of the pops, then people would view that as being, uh, that's, that's, that's mainstream, it's pop, uh, what they're doing and things like that. Really, it's when you make music, ultimately you make it for yourself, but it's nice to, to play it to people, man, and hear what they think and, and, and get reactions. And, you know, I, I, I like that. So, as far as I'm concerned, I want as many people as possible to hear my music. Drum and bass is the next level, and I think, personally, drum and bass is the music for the millennium. It's not following no commercial pattern. I mean, the, the commercial press, the commercial record labels focused on the scene for the last couple of years, and they've long moved off it onto Speed Garage, onto the next thing. But And people have even said, oh, drum and bass have died out. But that's bullshit, because the underground scene are still solid and following their roots. The majors of, like, you know, I mean... Come on, you know what I mean? It's 1998, they're still doing the same old thing, and really they've got to take more notice. And what I'd like to see happen is people like, you know, Frosty, Brian, um, you know, other people taking charge, and hopefully majors coming forward and saying, well, look, hang on a minute, you know what I mean? Everyone can have a piece of the pie, but why don't we do the a in okay? And they just sell the records, because that's what they're good at. Give us the distribution worldwide, and we take care of business. Sparkling day at the Heads Camp. It always starts in rain, but as you can see, it always finishes in bright sunshine. 7 1, Goldie at Headsville. 7 1, good day. We've got shows on Kiss, Radio 1. So, you know, 10, ten years from now, hopefully, it would have taken over the whole planet. Just locked on, it's Radio 1, it's Groove Rider in the chair till the hour of 4. Music policy, drum and bass strictly. As I say, in 15 minutes or so, we go into the mix from Cream Fields. Musicology, Radio 1 is where you hear it first, remember that. Some nice for the weather! Hey, well, it is 
just like we just try to stay on top of music. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we just always on the lookout for new things. You know, you can't get stuck in the same thing for so many years without changing. Do you know what I'm saying? And we're like, you know, we'd like to change. You know, it's progression for us, you know, and that's how we work, and that's how I work, that's, they're my rules. You know, always be on the lookout, never be negative to anything that's new, you know, and that's the way you learn. So now we're out to die, sub, also to crust. And not forgetting the hand poncho, Roddy size. I don't have a, like, uh, a plan or anything, you know, it's just whatever hits me at the time. Because music's a heart thing, it's not a head thing. DJing is really easy, okay? I mean, anyone can do it, you know? Anyone can play a couple of records, do you know what I mean? But, at the end of the day, you've got your dons, you've got your real heavyweights, you've got your maestros, you've got your leaders, and to me, if you ask me who the two best DJs in Breakbeat, drum and bass are, the two guys who I'd run a long way to go and listen to, it would be Groove Rider or Crust. At the end of the day, the Dons are the Dons, and you need them, and they inspire the Jay Magics and the Giles Petersons to go along and play a few breakbeat records and get away with it. <laughs> I just hope that, you know, one day I can switch on the radio and it's just going to be drum and bass all day long. Do you know what I mean? A lot of producers now have just got to keep their flavours. Instead of moving on to something new and forgetting the old flavours, yeah. forgetting the techno, forgetting... Maybe it's moved on to another thing now, they might forget the funk, they shouldn't forget the funk. Keep with the funk, keep all flavours running because it gets too concentrated into one flavour. Totally. I just think everyone should keep the flavours, keep all the flavours and keep rolling out all the flavours. In the future they can look at that and say that was as far into the future as anyone was going. To me it's the most futuristic music going at this present moment. There's nothing else that is so advanced. You know, every, every, every type of other type of music I look at it is um, very timid. If you knew what people were going to be making tomorrow, you would have made it last week, but... <laughs> it's just going to progress into... It's just, well, it's in its own thing already, it's established its own thing, and it will just carry on. From what I can see, drum and bass is just spreading all over the world, you know, which is another thing that shocks me. A lot of the artists are moving on to setting up other records or, or signing to bigger labels, but they keep putting out their underground tracks through a label like Metalheads, and that's so important for the music to be alive. Basically, all the overground people, they always look to the underground to see what's new, and they grab hold of that and make it overground. So, if we can establish a real underground drum and bass network in the States, then it's, it's going to cross over. It just might take 10 years. The times that they're going through now is the reward for all the times they went through then. Do you know what I mean? When they were putting in like three, four gigs a night, when guys were traveling like, yo, this part of London, that north of England, down here, over there. Yo, them, them, so they put in the work. They put in the work, so at the end of the day, they're just, they're just reaping the rewards of what they, they've created for themselves, really. So whether or not he stops tomorrow, I don't really give a fuck to be quite frank, because we did it all. I kind of did it all. I, don't really, I wasn't really supposed to get out of water, was I? Let's face it. I wasn't supposed to get further than the bottom of my, the bottom of the Louis Jersey Children's Home drive. But I got out. I got out of there. So anything, I don't really give a fuck what happens after tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? I could go home and die, and it doesn't really matter to me. What really matters is just that I'm not forgotten. The music is obviously is entombed, so to speak. It's already kind of scratched into the rocks. It already exists. 